thanks for introduction and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Salim and I'm working in the University of West Bohemia, Czech Republic. And uh, uh, I will talk about the magnetocrystalline anisotropy of uh, manganese dope topological insulator. But uh, 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 caring uh, to the context of the conference, I changed my strategy a little bit. I talked with one of the organizers, Dr. Rizwan, and uh, uh, we just, I include some basic slides from the, from the DFT and then I will talk about uh, some application. Okay, so please uh, don't uh, worry about this scary paragraph. So the aim of this paragraph is just to know that uh, how much people are familiar with this paragraph means they know the density functional theory, but unfortunately I can't see the audience. So let me start from the beginning. So I will talk about the density functional theory, uh, the Schrodinger wave equation, and uh, then DFT in the crystalline solid. And then I will talk about some of my projects and uh, my collaboration with different uh, experimental groups. So what is the importance of computational material science? So if you visit to some uh, uh, crystallographic servers, that are, some of them are commercial, then some free. So you will find that there are about 200,000 of uh, the crystals that are uh, known. And when you visit to the periodic table, so there are from 30 to 40 elements that are periodic. So if we just check the mathematically, so uh, we can get the probability of the material, which will be a huge number, but much, much more than 200,000. So that's why uh, we use, or uh, it highlights the importance of the computational material science. So, in computational material science, or in, let's say, with Ebenezer method, we can design the new material that have novel properties for future technological application to understand the mechanism and trend of these materials uh, that govern the microscopic properties. So, a uh, computational model can help this understanding and this model are based on quantum mechanical approach. So let's say this is me. Uh, we provide the input or we set up the experiment uh, to the computational model and then at the end we get some nice properties uh, such as electronic structure, density of state, charge density, and uh, plenty of particular uh, properties. But obviously, this is not a black box calculation, so you have to take care about each and every convergence parameter uh, to get some meaningful results. So, uh, let me explain you about some uh, old material, uh, such as magnetite and the quartz crystal. So, the first technological application of these materials is it is used uh, by the Chinese as a, uh, as, a, as a compass or as a lead stone. And in 19th century, the quartz crystal is, uh, it was like uh, uh, predicted that uh, the structure contains the piezoelectric properties and then later on it was used in the quartz clouds. So uh, to understand microscopic properties of this material, we can answer to the, to the questions that why the iron is ferromagnetic, why some materials are conducting, some of them are insulating, and some of them is uh, uh, optically objective. So, answer to these questions, uh, let's take a microscopic view of uh, these materials, such as magnetite. So, in a broader view, this material is made of atoms and the electrons bound these atoms to each other in the form of the glue, which has, again, uh, which has like interesting properties, such as charge, spin, mass, and Coulomb interaction. Now, to understand uh, these interactions, let's solve these uh, system with a quantum mechanical application. So I think these are some basic definitions and everyone know about this. So let me go forward. This is 
the quantum mechanical uh, equation for the many body electron system. So, this is the Hamiltonian, and the first term represents the kinetic energy of the nucleus, then the kinetic energy of the electron, electron electron interaction, and electron and nucleus interaction. So, for a simple system such as hydrogen atom, it is this equation is simple. But when we go to the many body electron system, then this equation is going to be more and more complicated. So the very first approximation was the bond upon Hamer approximation. So according to this approximation, the size of the nucleus is very big as compared to the electron and it is slow. So that's why the nucleus is considered as a point charge and its motion is freezed. Uh, this is... Uh, the wave function, which contains uh, the spatial coordinates for the electrons and the nuclei. And obviously, when you include the relativistic effect, then you will have additional term, which is spin. So now, uh, if you solve the Schrodinger equation for the many body electron system, let's say the hydrogen atom, which contains the seven electrons, and there are 21 coordinates like in for three degrees of freedom, if we use the 10 data points for uh, each coordinate, then it means that we need 10 to the power 12 gigabytes of, roughly speaking, 100 tons of the DVDs to solve this simple nitrogen atom. And now, or just imagine if you have the 100 atoms, such as platinum atoms, which contains uh, platinum has 78 uh, atoms, then just imagine how the problem is going to be more and more complicated. So here is uh, a nice paragraph from the uh, Nobel Prize lecture of the Walter Cohen that when you increase, uh, for example, for the real material, the, the, the number of the coordinates will be 10 to the power 23. And he called it the exponential walls that it is not feasible to solve the wave function for a mini body electron system. Now, let me tell you a short story uh, about uh, the DFT. It's about uh, the, uh, the, the most complicated machine, this accelerator, which is located in the sun, made by the human, uh, which uh, my mass of the Higgs boson. And now, uh, now, do not think like a scientist, but think like a manager that some delegation comes visit you from some delusion factory and they tell you that, okay, we can measure mass of the Higgs boson with a very simple machine. And what will be your decision? It means obviously you will go to the busiest way. And they say is that we have this small wood meter and this is just a story. We have a small old meter and we can measure mass of the Higgs boson. So now compare the many body Schrodinger equation is this complicated machine and density functional theory is this simple machine. So you replace this many body Schrodinger complicated many body Schrodinger wave equation uh, with the simple DFT equation. So it is non-interacting single electron equation. This equation is implemented in, uh, in several methods such as uh, APW, LMTO, KKR and many others and it is implemented in different codes such as Ventuk, WASP and SPR, KKR which are used universally. These are more uh, known codes. So, uh, let's uh, come to the heart of the DFT. According to the DFT, uh, this is like the short, uh, let me summarize the Hornberg uh, Cohen theorem. They say that there is one to one correspondence between the external potential and the wave function, and then the wave function and the density means you can get the same information from the density now instead of the wave function. So now you don't have. Like you don't need to solve the three n wave function for n particles, but just a density for three degrees of freedom. 
And then uh, later on, the Walter Cohen in his postdoc, Sham, MAPE, or solve the complicated interacting system in a tricky way to make it the single particle non interacting system. Just look to this equation. Here, all the other terms are known except this term, which is known as the exchange correlation term. And this term exists, but we don't know about this. So it contains all the unknown quantum mechanical interaction. And now let's go back to the slide. So uh, look to the red part. The company are the, uh, don't tell you about this unknown resistor. You can precisely by your mass of the mass of the Higgs boson if you know about this resistor, but this resistor is unknown and it has to be approximated. And actually this resistor is the exchange correlation functional. So we don't know about this functional and we have to approximate it. So there are many approximation. Uh, let me come to this uh, slide. So this is known as like, it is the earth of the, of the DFT when uh, at, at the first stage, they say is that the exchange correlation functional a small contribution as compared to the other terms and they neglect it. But when they calculated some, uh, some, some, some systems, so there was poor estimation uh, in, the, the, in the bound length in the latest parameter from 20 to 50 percent. And then it was realized that exchange correlation functional is a nature rule and you cannot avoid it. So the very, very first approximation for this one was the local spin density approximation or the local density approximation. So according to this approximation, the system was divided into small boxes in such a way that the density inside each box is uniform. And then uh, the, the whole boxes are integrated to get uh, information about the whole system. So this is like the popular picture of the painting of the Mona Lisa. So you cannot get the actual density like in, in, in this painting and the nearby or the, the nearest approximation is like you see this blur picture and this is from the local density approximation. So uh, this approximation works very well for the for the metal. It was just like incidentally, but in the, in the metals we have more free electron, which is the nearest approach to the, the uniform electron gas. However, for the for the for the semiconductors and some other materials, uh, uh, it's, this was not accurate. And then uh, the, uh, the the gradient term is introduced in the in the density. Like this was in uh, the generalized gradient approximation. And still, there are ongoing efforts to improve the exchange correlation uh, function and to reach the chemical accuracy. So now let's come to the crystals. Uh, in the codes or in the DFT, we take uh, the structure is periodic. So here is the, the quartz crystal and this is its length. We take it in the unit cell because there is periodicity in the structure and then we solve the block function. So, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm at home and I have one kid. So. Uh, so, we use uh, the block table to solve uh, this periodic system and in the code, we convert the real lattice to the uh, to the reciprocal space, and then map the k points uh, in the first Brillian zone because the Wigner set pair in the in the uh, reciprocal space is the first Brillian zone, and then we map the k points in the first Brillian zone to get the results. So much more explanation is not here because of the time. Uh, here is the solution of the Schrodinger uh, of the Cohen Sham equation. There are two methods. So the first one is the variational method, where you uh, take the, the, the Cohen Sham orbital is the linear combination of the basis set, and you can solve it in different ways. So the first one is the plane wave, which is suitable like uh, for the for the uniform electron gaze. Or, uh, 
in different plain way of codes. They are so solid in a bit tricky ways. The localized method and then the linear augmented plane wave are the most accurate full potential linear augmented plane wave and then another method uh, which is uh, the, the scattering technique they use the, the greens function instead of the wave function but at the end uh, both uh, the codes are comparable to each other the results will be the same this is comparison between the wave function and the greens function method for example, if we uh, make calculation for a big system, uh, or if we do uh, 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 some some uh, element in a very very small concentration, then in the band structure method, we have to make the size of the supercell very very big, and it is very computationally very expensive and cumbersome. So uh, in this method, we don't need to make the supercell and use this technique which is known as the coherent potential approximation in this approximation we, we, we keep small concentration in the partial occupation and then take average of the greens function so here i will talk about uh, some of uh, my uh, my projects so in which i collaborate with uh, different experimental groups this was my first project. Uh, it was about the uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy of the iron platinum, which is the intrinsic property of the material. It is used uh, for uh, uh, the data storage devices. So these calculations are very, very uh, sensitive and computationally uh, very expensive. Also, there was a bunch of the value, uh, which vary from 1.7 to, to 4. An experimental value is like 1.3, so no one know which value is accurate. So we use two different methods and uh, take care of about every convergence parameter and find uh, some reasonable values. So still they are a bit away from the experimental values. So there are two reasons that uh, there is always uh, because in the theory model is modern, but in the real system there is always disorder. So maybe disorder like reduce the value of the magnetocrystalline anisotropy or another reason that maybe the local density approximation is not uh, able to produce accurate value of the magnetocrystalline anisotropy and one has to go beyond the local density approximation and now I'm using the DFT. So this is the schematic diagram. So I will not go to the details. Uh, this project which I recently completed with experimental group, it's about the boron silicon system. So the idea behind this project is uh, to, 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 to model or to, to design the hyper solar cell, which is very uh, attractive in terms of efficiency and cost. So the silicon surface is very reactive and if we absorb the molecule on top of the silicon surface, so it's less its identity because of the surface reactivity. So how to perceive this uh, this uh, surface reactivity? We absorb or we dope the boron atom uh, in the surface, and it reduce it perceive the surface and make it suitable for absorption of the molecule. So here you see some uh, microscopic images, the shiny, the thin shiny uh, stars. Uh, represent the position of the boron atom, but still we don't know about the stable position of the boron atom. So for this, I made uh, models. This is the lead pattern, which clear that uh, the boron surface has under root 3, under root 3 reconstruction. So here you see this under root 3, under root 3 construction. The figure is not completed because I take it from my published paper and uh, I cut it here, but you means in the full picture you will see the the dangling bonds which I saturated with the hydrogen atoms, and I found the I calculated the ground state energy for different configuration, but it was not sufficient. <coughs> so what I did, I calculated the energetics using the M initial and uh, make a comparison with the experiment. So here are two uh, measurements with Dr. Salim Ayal. Can you conclude, please? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Now I'm okay. So uh, this project uh, is uh, with the experimental group from the NASP with Dr. Rizwan. So with the DFT means I have to answer. Uh, 
what is the stable position of the dopant in the material in the magazine, from where the magnetisms come and what is the nature of magnetization. So one of the students will talk about this. It's about the topological insulator. So I'm sorry, I'm just exceeding the time. So I, I'm not able to talk about it much more. I also did uh, some modeling for it to find the stable position of the manganese atoms in the layer. Uh, we published this data in the nature. And here you see the magnetic hysteresis loop. Uh, one is uh, just look to the basement telluride uh, for outer plane. Uh, the hysteresis loop, the area of the hysteresis loop is big, and here it's small. So we calculate the magnetocrystalline anisotropy for this, and then finally we conclude the results that this change is because of the weak spin orbit coupling in the, in the at the selenium side, which overcome the dipole dipole interaction. Still, we are. Uh, uh, connected with this project to find uh, reason for uh, this in-plane and out-of-plane magnetization. Uh, let me come to the end. Uh, this is the model of the surface machine which we have in our group. So we have the theoretical expertise and as well as the experimental expertise. This is the real picture of this machine. So in future we can host your student. Uh, let me summarize my talk. We use DFT, let's say it's more exaggerated, but we use DFT as theoretical microscope. We, the, we see like the structure beyond the current capability of the experiment. We predict the properties at the resolution and lens in uh, currently, which is currently inaccessible to the experiment. Uh, we have complete control of the degrees of freedoms uh, in our calculations. Uh, but obviously, model is always model, so we cannot re replace the lab experiment with the AB initio, so we can always go hands in hands with the experiment. So finally, I summarize my results that uh, DFT is a powerful tool for microscope, and here are some points, so everybody can, uh, I'm sorry, everybody can see it. It's about topological insulators. And uh, finally, I conclude, uh, I acknowledge my group. So thanks a lot. I'm sorry, I couldn't. Come. Thank you, Dr. Salim Ayaz, for for the for the great talk uh, on your DFT calculations. And uh, uh, there, are, I, I also have some questions. But first of all, we need to go to the audience uh, because we are short in time. So, Rida, can you, Rida, Rida Batul, can you ask your question, please? Rida Batul, can you ask your question, please? Rida Batul? Rida Batul, can you hear us? Can you ask your question, please? Majibin Fatima, can you ask your question, please? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm thankful to Dr. Salim for an important discussion related to DFT study. I wanted to ask, sir, that do any difference occur in properties of materials if we use LAPW, LMTO, PAW, or KKR method? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, actually, <coughs> the, uh, the plane wave method and the plane wave method solve the system in a bit tricky ways. Okay, so uh, they freeze the core electron uh, with the nucleus with a constant potential and only deal with the valence electron properly. Okay, so uh, uh, let's say that they, 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 uh, as they replace the core electron with a constant potential, so the core electron are not properly deal with the, uh, in the, in the plane wave method. So if you come to the pull potential, Linear augmented plane wave are the full potential, so they deal the core electron realistically. Okay, the LMTO is again they they do some approximation, and if you just I think I include some slides here. Yeah, so uh, it's not here, but okay. You see, uh, look to this part. Okay, this is the plane wave, 
and when you come close to the nucleus, then they somehow modulate this this wave with a constant potential. So the core electron are not properly dealing the plane wave method. But if you come to the full potential method, then they solve the plane wave, uh, like, uh, the plane wave properly, and also they deal the the the, the spheric wave uh, in uh, in atomic like partial waves. So here you see this this is. Uh, this is the region where you have the nucleus or where you have your open tense pair, and this is the plane wave region. So the full potential method deal the core electron properly. So it's it's a true method. Thank you, Dr. Salimayaz. Uh, we'll allow another question. Uh, Ms. Jamila Fatima, please, can you ask your question? Thank you for uh, such a detailed explanation about uh, DFT, first of all. Um, secondly, I wanted to ask, is there uh, any specific approximation that should be used for calculating the properties of uh, 2D materials? Uh, it's difficult because we have like a zoo of approximation means uh, if you just check the exchange, you are working with the DFT, and if you check the exchange correlation library of the LDAs in the GGA, you will find a plenty of functionals and then they are uh, like uh, more functional like this hybrid functional modified Dickey Johnson uh, approximation so it depends on the, uh, on, on the nature of your system uh, for example for the structure relaxation and for some basic properties uh, LDA and DGA works very well but if you have some highly correlating system then you have to go to the the, to the U parameter and you have to go to the Hubbard parameter and maybe if you want to include the temperature effect then you will go to the dynamic and mean theory but of course then your system will be computationally more and more complicated and cumbersome. Okay, thank you Dr. Salim I asked, you know we have a lot of questions, we have a lot of raised hands and we have a lot of questions but unfortunately we are not able to ask. I also have some questions but I think I may have to ask them offline. Uh, so yeah, I'm for really with these guys, so I'm open for everyone. Means you can ask, and, uh, and actually, uh, it was my fault. I couldn't control my talk in this specific time, so <laughs> no, that's totally fine. And uh, I think uh, many in the audience and panels, uh, they can connect with you uh, later on if they. Of want course, to, I'm uh, open for all type of questions. Question or, or or want to collaborate on any research that you're doing. But thanks a lot, thank you. It was a very good talk and I'm sure it was useful for the hundreds and hundreds of audience that we have, you know, watching your talk at the moment. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Most welcome for collaboration. <laughs> thank you. So now I would like to